I'd like to introduce Deb Ward, University Librarian and Interim Vice Provost for the University of Missouri Libraries. Take it away, Deb. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this fourth in the University Press and University Book Talk series with the libraries. We're just so glad that you've joined us this afternoon to hear author Benjamin Moore discuss his book, The Names of John Gergen, Immigrant Identities in Early 20th Century St. Louis. You may not know that this project started when Dr. Moore discovered papers from the year 1917 in an alley dumpster. We salute Dr. Moore's recognition of the historical worth in the discarded papers, and we applaud the 14 years he subsequently spent searching libraries and archives to more fully answer the question, who was John Gergen? Well, we in libraries know, and this discovery demonstrates the lasting power that words can have when they're committed to paper. It doesn't matter how ephemeral those words may have seemed at the time. When such writings are saved, future generations have the chance to view them from a vantage point that is further along in the human journey. And that's what gives us the opportunity to learn about ourselves, who we were then and who we are today. The immigrant experience is embedded in the heritage of many Americans, making this book relevant to so many. And we thank you, Dr. Moore, for your contribution in this book form, which the library will, of course, save for the next hundred years and beyond. So now I'd like to introduce our colleague, David Rosenbaum, director of the University of Missouri Press, who will share more information about the book and its author. Over to you, David. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Benjamin Moore is Professor Emeritus of English and is the senior researcher at the Center for Bosnian Studies at Fontbonne University in St. Louis, where he has taught since 1994. He earned his PhD at the University of Iowa in 92 in the field of 18th century literature. Professor Moore has received numerous awards for his teaching and research, including the Governor's Award for Excellence in Teaching Twice and the Focus St. Louis What's Right with the Regional Award for Improving Racial Equality and Social Justice. In 2006, he founded the Bosnian Memory Project, which fosters understanding of St. Louis's Bosnian community and documents the experiences of Bosnian genocide survivors and their children. Professor Moore speaks frequently about the Bosnian diaspora and helped to develop the traveling exhibit Priador, Lives from the Bosnian Genocide, which has been shown at 21 locations nationally, including Capitol Hill. Professor Moore's research into Banat Swabian immigration unfolded alongside his work with Bosnian survivors. In 2005, as you've already heard, he found in a city dumpster schoolwork from the 1917-1918 school year produced by a nine-year-old Banat Swabian, John Gergen. The discovery sent him on a 15-year quest to uncover the identities and experiences of John Gergen and his relatives. A portion of this research was previously published by the Missouri Historical Society as Who Was John Gergen? Unraveling the Identity of an Early 20th Century Immigrant, which received the Missouri Conference on History's Best Article Award. A recent review by the Missouri Historical Review describes the book as a masterful study of the extended family Gergen and his challenging adaptation to America and St. Louis. The review further added that readers owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Moore for humanizing the Gergen family and taking readers for a rewarding journey. So please join me in welcoming Professor Moore. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, David, for that kind introduction. Uh, and let me generally thank the University of Missouri Libraries and the University of Missouri Press the former for arranging this event and the latter for supporting the publication of a book which admittedly had an unconventional beginning. Um, it's been wonderful to work with both entities. Uh, the University of Missouri Press in so many different ways has given so much support and guidance through the process of publishing this book and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I've enjoyed everybody whom I've worked with in this process. Um, let, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. Um, so, as was mentioned, this project started when I found in a dumpster uh, more than 100 pages of young John Gergen's schoolwork, and it had molded away for some 80 years in a boarded up tenement, and it had finally been thrown away when the tenement was being cleared out. There's a lot of renovation going on, or there was at the time a lot of renovation going on in that neighborhood. 
And so I don't know where the schoolwork had been, a closet, an attic, a basement, but it had somehow survived uh, for those 80 years and ended up in that dumpster. So I, so I took the schoolwork home and, and I got rather fascinated with it. Maybe at times even a little bit obsessed. And uh, I determined that I would try to find out as much as I can, could about John Bergen and, and about his family and about his story. And the schoolwork, as you've heard, led to years long research. And I discovered a great deal about not only John and his family, but also about um, his um, background and his uh, origins in an agrarian German speaking immigrant community, which originated in Southern Hungary. Hungary. And I think the value of this research, which was rooted mainly in primary sources like immigration records and census records, records that are familiar to people who have conducted genealogy, was that it revealed the life of someone who by the standards of his day was a nobody. He was an immigrant and an orphan. His father, who was a man named Peter Albeck, died less than a year <clears throat> after immigrating to St. Louis. He died from a workplace injury. His mother, who shortly afterwards became pregnant and started a new family, handed the two-year-old John off to relatives by the name of Gergen, who had also immigrated to St. Louis. Though John's handwriting was beautiful, he otherwise fared poorly in school. Uh, he fell a year behind. He was required to attend summer school. He was labeled as pedagogically retarded. And I'm sorry to use the word, but it was the term of the day. Um, and he left school before completing the seventh grade. Uh, he died young at age 26 in 1935 after suffering for years from spinal and pulmonary tuberculosis that left him greatly debilitated. His foster father, who is also named John, didn't fare much better. He suffered a debilitating stroke. And, um, when, and that, that took place when John was 20. And he died in 1940 at the age of 53 after fracturing his skull in a fall that was a result of the paralysis that the stroke had caused. So it was a difficult life. But there were beautiful things, achievements, if you will, in young John Gergen's life. He learned to play the clarinet and the saxophone. He was godfather to a young cousin. He became an iron worker, as well as a member of a socialist organization that advocated against fascism and racism. He and his foster parents were eventually able to leave the tenements and move to a small cottage in a working class residential neighborhood in South St. Louis, where John uh, was living when he died in 1935. And the neighborhood was the, 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 they moved to was the Bebo Mill neighborhood, is the Bebo Mill neighborhood. And John, therefore, his story, therefore, represents those anonymous and countless working class immigrants who populated the industrial centers of Midwestern cities and who have largely been forgotten especially as individuals. About John Gergen, we know little enough. About most of the others, we know virtually nothing. Of course, these life events that I've just recounted were sifted from the archival records only piecemeal and out of chronological order. And it was up to me to assemble the pieces into the story that frames this book and to weigh the story's significance. Part of my initial motivation was really to test how much a forgotten person could be uncovered from the historical record and from the single surviving family member old enough to remember John. And that was his cousin and goddaughter, a woman named Anna, who died in 2015 at the age of 88. And you'll, you'll see some photographs of John as we progress further through this. But, um, and, and Anna was the source of these photographs. But, but eventually the interest in uncovering John's story gave way to examining how the institutions that migrants encountered shaped their experience and identities. 
And the book thereby became a kind of combination of biography and social history. Uh, John's schoolwork remains the best evidence of his encounters with institutions. So I'd like to read a selection from a chapter in the middle of the book that focuses on this. And it's, it's a fairly generous um, uh, quotation. I don't look at John Gergen's third grade schoolwork very often. The pages are fragile and brittle. And when I touch them, crumbs of paper fall off of the edges. I usually consult photo scans that I made soon after I found the schoolwork. But when I do look at the physical pages, they appear less as texts than as artifacts. Their deterioration speaks to the passage of time and the invasion of the elements. Water especially has left its mark, rotting the edges of many of the pages and nurturing the mildew that has left the thin crusts of black dust, sometimes obscuring words that I am still trying to read. The staples that once held the sheets together into booklets have long since rusted away. Beneath the staining and decay, we can trace the movements of John Gergen's nine-year-old hand as he struggled to write letters and words in a slanted script that is sometimes fluid and sometimes cramped or jagged. We can even imagine the working of John's mind as he struggled unsuccessfully to solve math problems and grapple with lessons of all sorts, moral, practical, and intellectual. These 124 pages of schoolwork also represent the educational beliefs and practices of St. Peter and Paul School in St. Louis. In the pages, we see the range of things that the school valued, good handwriting, an appropriate vocabulary, an American history, German Catholicism, and good hygiene. The lessons and their teachers required students to copy, memorize, and write from dictation. To a nine-year-old, the cruelest form of subjection. The writings therefore testify to the interface between the institutional world of parochial schooling and the subjectivity of young John Bergen. To read John's schoolwork is to encounter a part of his personhood and to witness the process that processes that shaped his emerging public persona, as well as his ability to read, write, remember, calculate, and otherwise think. It is to glimpse the complicated and difficult experience of growing up, of developing identity, and of obtaining agency, however imperfectly. The schoolwork may even be an emblem for John himself, labored in the rendering, flawed in the result, and ultimately forgotten. And that's the end of the passage. I should also point out, as you can see from this example that's on your screen, that the schoolwork in some cases was in two languages, German and English, because German was one of the languages of instruction at St. Peter and Paul School. Now, John's German that he spoke at home was a different variety of German from the standard German that he learned in school. And so even that question of the German language becomes a bit complex. But immediately when I found this work, I was mesmerized with the um, Suterland handwriting and with the um, German language passages that were in the school work. It suggested John's ethnic complexity, but it would take me a very long time to discover just how complex um, John's ethnicity really was. So one of the thing by way of introduction, and it's important, John's name changed with his circumstances. And he had at least seven names, hence the title of the book, The Names of John Gergen. He was baptized in his, his Hungarian village under his Hungarian name, Janusz Albeck. But at home, he was called by his German name, Johann Albeck. And when at age two, he was given away to foster parents, he became Janusz or Johann Gergen. And when he entered kindergarten in St. Louis, he became John Gergen. When he applied for citizenship at age 18, he became John Albeck. 
and he was buried under the name John Albeck Gergen. Of course, names aren't the only signifiers of identity, but they're important ones. And the names of John Gergen indicate that John's identities were malleable, contingent on his relationships to families, cultures, nations, and institutions. And this to me has been one of the most interesting parts of the project to understand the malleability of identities and the way that has played out in the lives of people who migrate. Um, I'd like to turn now to the all important question of place, which is really inextricable from the question of John's national and institutional identities. Identities all are after all constructed in specific places, whether it's a village in Southeastern Europe or a school in a working class neighborhood in St. Louis. The complexity of immigrant identities rise from the multiplicity of places and cultures. Physically, one can inhabit only a single space, but culturally and emotionally, we can inhabit, inhabit many places. Um, John came from an area of Southern Hungary, and this is pre-Trianon Hungary. This is when Hungary was larger and part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was in the immediate Southeast of Hungary, just North of Serbia, just Northwest of um, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, just uh, West of, I'm sorry, just Northeast of Bosnia-Herzegovina, just East of Croatia. And you, you can make out a little, it's kind of a parallelogram of territory that's enclosed within that blue box. Uh, the Bannet was highly multi-ethnic. And John was part of a Catholic German minority known as Swabians who lived among Hungarians, Serbs, Romanians, Romani, and Jews. Um, and just a note about pronunciation, it's, it's often pronounced in the United States, Banat Swabian. But after talking to people from the Banat, I have learned to retool my pronunciation to Banat Swabian because this is what's generally said in Hungary and in places where Swabians have since migrated in Germany. Um, and while we're talking about the Banat, while we're on that part of John's geographical past, um, let me look ahead here just a bit to 1920, 10 years after John migrated to St. Louis as a two-year-old. And that year, following World War I, the Bannet was dismantled as part of the settlement of World War I with the Treaty of Trianon. And part of the Bannet went to Romania, part of it to the newly formed Yugoslavia, and only a small sliver of it in the Northwest remained in Hungary. So, so if you can take that image from the map here and transpose it into the lower right hand corner of the map here, you can see that division of this, of, of this part of Hungary. Uh, the part of the Bennett that John was born from went to Romania, probably without his knowing it. Uh, after all, he was only 12. And certainly um, he um, did not realize that um, this change made him no longer Hungarian, but Romanian. And in fact, I'm gonna to have to backtrack here just a little bit, but when he filed his declaration of intention to become a US citizen, you can look at the lower part that has the um, yellow highlighting under it. He applied both as a German because of his ethnicity and, and as a Romanian because of the fact that his hometown from where he was born was now in Romania, even though he had never been there. It's yet another complication in an already um, complicated identity. Um, but back to 1910, John was part of a transnational circulation of labor migrants that brought tens of millions of people to the Americas over the course of a century up until World War I. By 1900, these migrants came increasingly from Southern and Eastern Europe what is sometimes um, um, called in the United States, the new immigration. 
And, and increasingly people sought work in the industrial cities of the Midwest as well as the East Coast. Uh, also, many of these migrants returned home and John himself returned to the Bannock at the age of three and spent a year there. He therefore um, crossed the Atlantic uh, three times. And um, in St. Louis, migrants from the Bannock settled almost exclusively in the urban neighborhood of Soulard, which is one of the most um, densely populated, or which was at the time, one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in uh, St. Louis. Uh, previously, it had, it had been a largely middle-class German neighborhood, but by 1900, many of the houses were divided into tenements and factories were as numerous as churches. St. Louis at the time was the fourth largest city in the US with more than two thirds of a million people. And this, and, and in, in this map, west is up and east is down towards the Mississippi River. Um, and uh, the eastern portions of the city, which were also the oldest and most industrial portions of the city, were among the most thickly populated parts of the city. Um, the tenement where I found the schoolwork was in the heart of Soulard, which in 1910 had a population of about 50,000. Um, well over 5,000 of Soulard's residents, but probably closer to 10,000, were Bannett Swabians. The others being Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, Serbs, Romanians, and a few remaining Germans who had not moved to the newer subdivisions in the south of St. Louis. Remarkably, the Bannett Swabians until now have been entirely omitted from the published histories of St. Louis even though they were to become ancestors of tens of thousands of St. Louis's living today. And, and Soulard in 1910 was a remarkable place crowded with shops, warehouses, breweries, and mills that stood shoulder to shoulder with the tenements. And most of these tenements had formerly been um, single family residences. There might've been a servant family living there, but they had been divided up into a, um, smaller apartments. Uh, bordered by the Mississippi, on the east, it was crisscrossed with streetcar lines and dotted with saloons and churches. It was smoky, noisy, and crowded. And the factories there were dangerous. For example, the corded fa cordage factory, uh, not far from where uh, I found the schoolwork, um, where immigrant um, workers were injured and on two occasions killed after stumbling into the rope weaving machinery or the nearby car works a bit closer to the river where workers assembled railroad cars and often faced accidents of all kinds. And these were often graphically documented in the newspapers of the day. I'll spare you the details. Um, between um, uh, faced with bleak living and working conditions, many Bannock Swabians returned home after making enough money to buy farmland, but many more arrived to take their place. Between 1903 and 1914, there was, there was a constant circulation of people between Soulard and the Bannock. And this is one reason that I use the term migrant as well as immigrant. Even those migrants who chose to stay in Soulard often made the decision passively, never fully committing to an American identity. Many never became US citizens and virtually all had family and friends in the Bannock with whom they remained in touch, at least until World War II. And so up until, until World War II, um, e even during World War I, they were a very transnational community. Uh, as the influx of migrants into Soulard continued to increase, the various authorities that oversaw immigration and, and that ranged from governments to the steamship companies in Germany to the St. Louis city government, became preoccupied with finding ways of sorting and processing migrants so that they could be transformed into obedient industrial workers and citizens. And so the spaces that these migrants inhabited um, from the steamships themselves to the schools that their children attended, what I often call micro geographies, 
became sites of disciplining behavior and reshaping identities. We, we see this process, of course, and we, we've seen it in John Gergen's schoolwork, and it was also at work in places like factories, the neighborhood bathhouse in Soulard, and public libraries, uh, not to mention the courts where immigrants um, became naturalized. But in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on two examples of specific places where Bennett Swabians and other migrants who lived in Soulard faced efforts to reform how they acted and who they were. And you'll notice that underlying everything is this ubiquitous form of the grid where lines of authority position people according to predetermined norms, whether it's the grid of the streets in Soulard, the grid of John's teacher's grade book, or the grid of monks in the steerage passage. It just, uh, it, it just appears again and again as a way of ordering um, populations. You, you know, we look at ship's manifests, for example. I don't have an image of any um, for this presentation, but they're in a grid. You know, we look at the census, it's in a grid. And um, e everywhere we turn, um, we find this as an ordering mechanism, which is seeking to find ways of understanding this diverse population um, th that um, authorities are trying to really get their heads around. But let, let's start with the steamships. All of the steamships that John Gergen's family migrated on were built after 1896. So they were really newer steamships. And they housed very carefully designed environments for the passage. And a great deal has been written, especially for somewhat earlier passages in the 19th century of what is sometimes called the horrors of steerage, which was the lowest class of travel. But little has been written about the ways that steerage in the late 19th and early 20th century centuries uh, actually prepared passengers for the working life to come. It was, a, it was one of the points of transition from backgrounds that were often rural to backgrounds where people would be in confined spaces in factories. Even if a migrant was lucky enough to travel second class, which was very rare for labor migrants, the passage was characterized by confinement and routine. The ship's architecture itself had multiple classes of travel reflecting the multiple classes of society. And this image here, which is um, of the Kaiser and August Victoria, um, which was the ship that John was on along with his foster mother, the third time he crossed the ocean and the second time he crossed uh, from east to west, uh, shows both the second class accommodations and beneath it, the steerage accommodations, those boxes with X's are the individual bunks in steerage. Um, as I write in the book, in the steerage efficiency was maximized in the face of diversity of language and culture. Time itself was punctuated by the routine of shipboard life. The spatial and temporal confinement in a carefully engineered environment caused migrants to experience their identities in new ways as part of a diverse populace subject to the routine regulation of both mind and body. It was good preparation for the working life to come. And then a second example, a little closer to home, was the branch library in Sular, just a short walk away from the tenement where I found John's schoolwork. It was built in 1909, largely for the purpose of Americanizing the neighborhood's immigrants. Located immediately next door to a police station, which is a really interesting juxtaposition of uh, authority and culture. It was less a repository than a civic space. And the design of the building's interior speaks to the relationship between American cultural authority and the library's foreign-born clientele in Soulard. Um, as you see at the center of the main floor was the circulation desk. It allowed oversight of the entire room 
and served as a point for distributing books brought from the main repository downtown. The room was divided evenly, as you can see, between a children's section and an adult section. And then downstairs were um, meeting rooms, which were regularly used for evening English classes. There was also a theater where children were shown English language movies. There's that grit again. Children were easy to reach, not only because they adapted quickly to English, but also because there was a playground across the street from the library. And, and the library was really part of a kind of civic um, center within Soulard with the police station next door. Um, the playground across the street behind the playground was Soulard Market, which many people are familiar with. And then just a, less than a block away was the Soulard Bathhouse, which was also built in 1909, 1909 um, really for the purpose of giving immigrants who often had no running water in their tenements a place to bathe. There was also a swimming pool in the bathhouse, uh, so it was an important place for recreation. Um, but often too busy to come to the library, foreign, uh, foreign um, born adults were difficult to reach, and they were targets of considerable canvassing and outreach wrote one library, and I'm quoting from her account that was written in 1911. The library assistants had visited schools, settlements, and churches. Large posters and small leaflets had been prepared, calling attention to the books, reading room, auditorium, and club rooms. The posters had been displayed in windows, and the leaflets in both German and English had been distributed in factories, clubs, shops, from house to house, and in the Soulard open market. An assistant has taken applications to houses of foreigners who wanted books, but were too shy or too busy to come to the library to apply for cards. Names and addresses have been secured by noting children who use their own cards to take home books for their parents. And so there was, there was a tremendous effort to try to disseminate the cultural authority that was centered in the library into the surrounding neighborhood which of course was a process of Americanization. But despite the librarians' best efforts, immigrants in Soulard largely resisted efforts to Americanize them. Um, in 1917, the year that the US entered World War I, the same Soulard, Soulard librarian who narrated that um, account of the outreach efforts um, wrote of an incident in which, and I quote, Hungarian women were dragooned by a social worker and a steamship agent's wife into organizing to study English. The women came to the library once and stared for an evening at the charmeuse dress and fresh complexion of the debutante who was their teacher. The next week, they went on strike without warning and allowed the instructor and her protector to twirl their thumbs until the library's closing time. You know, I, I think that there's a popular perception that in the early 20th century, um, immigrants embraced Americanization. But there's a good bit of evidence that that was not always the case. So, so to summarize, um, the lives of John Gergen and his kin show that what has traditionally been called Americanization was actually a haphazard and contradictory negotiation of the various institutions and practices that they encountered. And this process was really never completed in their lifetimes. Though they purchased houses in burial plots in St. Louis, the Gurgans and others like them remained immigrants to the very last. In some ways they remained Bennett Swabians to the very last, never fully associating from their Bennett Swabian identities. Historically, immigrants' lives in the United States have been understood in terms of their aspirations and transformations, especially their transformations into Americans. But I think that their lives are better understood in terms of the cumulative and sometimes fragmentary effects of numerous institutions they encountered, ranging from the steamship industry to the schools. I'd like to close this portion of the event by considering briefly what happened to John Gergen 
I mentioned before that he died in 1935 at age 26 of tuberculosis, following at least four years of sickness that affected his spine as well as his lungs. One of the memories that um, John's goddaughter Anna had of him was seeing him in a body cast. But, but to complete the tragedy after his death, John Gergen was almost entirely forgotten by his family as well as by history. In this respect, he shared the same fate as the great majority of working class migrants whose names and stories are now seldom uttered, at least not at the level of the individual. Also aiding the forgetting were a number of changes in St. Louis society. The most obvious was the assimilation of the younger generation, the generation born in the United States, who generally married outside of the Vanitswavian community and made substantial efforts to leave the working class behind. But the destruction and revitalization of Soulard, the former in the 1950s and 1960s and the latter, the revitalization in the 1970s and 1980s, also contributed to the forgetting, especially the forgetting of life in the tenements and what came before that. In the 1950s and 1960s, more than half of Soulard was raised and what remained was scarred by interstate highways and other thoroughfares that split Soulard into multiple sections. And then beginning in the 1970s, Soulard was slowly gentrified so that its history as an early 20th century working class immigrant haven was largely erased. Um, in, in the popular culture of Soulard, it's really the French beginnings that go back to the late 18th and early 19th century that are celebrated, most notably in the Mardi Gras, not the later German um, um, settlement within the neighborhood and certainly not the later settlement in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by migrants who came from Southeastern and Eastern Europe. And so I'd like to end by reading from a section of the book that I hope brings these strands together. And again, it's a fairly generous um, quotation. Sometimes on my walks, I stop at 1855 Menard Street in Soulard where John's aunt Anna Berger gave birth to a stillborn son and to her first child to live. And, and eventually she would also give birth to Anna, John's goddaughter. New row houses stand there now, built during the pandemic of 2020. When I wrote that, I didn't know that it would still be the pandemic in 2022. Looking northeast through a chain link fence, fence across the chasm that holds the highway, I can see the roof of the old city hospital where John's birth father and foster father both died. It has been converted to luxury apartments. A little closer to the highway are the former grounds of the St. Louis Cordage Company. A new Protestant church stands there. The Cordage factory itself burned to the ground in 1994 in a spectacular fire that sent debris tumbling onto the southbound lanes of Interstate 44. Arson was suspected. Now the noise of traffic makes it difficult to hear anything else. It is easy to get lost watching the patterns of the trucks and cars merging and changing lanes where hundreds of people once lived and worked. As for young John Gergen, daily I wonder about him things that I cannot know. So many questions could be answered if I could only find the right documents. Others are impenetrable. Did he ever meet his half-brothers and half-sisters? Did he travel? Did he read? What were his favorite books? Did he go to the movies? Did he drive a car? Did he miss his birth mother? Did he forget her? Or was forgiveness even an issue? Was he able to adjust his expectations about his life and accept, accept the limits that were placed on it by his birth father's death, by his failure to achieve in school, 
by his foster father's disability and by his own tuberculosis. At what point did he understand that his life was coming to an early end? Did he fear it? Was he able to accept the fact that the possibilities that give meaning to the lives of so many of us were simply not available to him? But there are no answers. Sometimes I imagine finding more documents and not just in my waking hours. Once in an image from my own childhood, I dreamed of finding bushel baskets of John's letters and diaries sitting beside a field of green beans. But I am convinced that there is nothing more that can be known about John Gergen, nor could any amount of research redeem the hard truth that John's thoughts and memories died with him. John is therefore what all of us have the potential to be. None of us can be certain that we will be remembered or for that matter, that we will be forgotten. But if we are not consigned to oblivion, then it will be the institutional identities that remain. The names, the vital records, and the fragments of expression that will offer glimpses into who we once were. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. I feel like you touched on so many different elements in this book, just by um, tracing the life of John Gergen and the different kinds of things he may have experienced. And yet uh, in only the 30 or 40 minutes you've had to speak, you've only been able to touch on some of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had to, and to the audience, I just wanna say that Dr. Moore did have to pick and choose what he was gonna talk to you about today. If any of this interested you, um, we want you to know that the book is available and um, as part of this special event, the uh, University of Missouri Press is offering a, a code for a discount. Um, let me just bring Robin back in to this. Thanks, uh, Marie. I'm right yeah. here. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to take, take it away, Robin. Oh, yeah. You can purchase this book uh, and, and we encourage you to purchase this, this great book. I'm currently reading it right now and I can't put it down. Um, we are offering it. To, uh, today and for a limited time for a special price of $30 plus free shipping. Um, if you go to our website, upress.missouri.edu um, and use the code MORE30 in the uh, shopping cart. So, and that's good through March 1st. So go take it away, Murray, if you have other comments. I have so many questions and I know our, our viewers have a lot of questions that I'm really excited to pose to, to Ben. Yeah, sure. Um, what we want to do now is move right into the question and answer portion of the presentation. Right now it's quarter to five. We'll, we'll do questions up to five and beyond. If, if people have additional questions, we can go beyond that time. And um, uh, looks like some people have entered things in the chat box, which is great. Remember that the Q&A box is there as well. Um, so uh, yeah, let's just go right. Let's start with the questions. I'm I can't wait for this part. My favorite part, too. Um, I will start with a comment in the Q&A box uh, right before we started. Um, uh, from It looks like uh, a student of Ben's. Um, uh, someone, com I'm in, uh, someone commented that I'm in St. Louis. Ben was my professor and mentor when I was a student at Fontbonne. I, of course, am reading this, his book with lots of excitement. It's wonderful, thank you. Um, let's see, um, I got, I have a lot of questions in the ch chat box that I'll start with. Um, some of the, the questions have sort of been answered among the, the participants, which I think is cool. Um, but I'll just, um, someone asks, uh, Diane asks, is the Soulard Library still there? Um, and then Ellen uh, comments, that, no, sorry, Jane commented that she believes that the library is still there, but closed. Right. Um, and then um, there was another question about the, um, inf of the 1918 influenza. Um, was there any mention of the 1918 influenza pandemic in the papers? And, and Jane also touched on that, on that one. Um, that not a lot was mentioned. Um, but if you, if you have other thoughts or other you know, comments yeah, about the 1918 influenza, go for it. 
I write about that in detail in the book because it really was important in John's life. Um, and uh, it, as you observe, was during the year that this schoolwork was produced, which was the 1917-1918 school year. It was really the following fall in 1918 when the influenza became pronounced. Um, so, so there's no direct record in the, um, in the schoolwork, but it, it was interesting to extrapolate from the historical record um, how that affected John and the times, for example, when his school was closed, when the library was closed in Sular, when he was really essentially confined to his apartment in the tenement where I found this schoolwork, probably with his foster mother, Rose Gergen, present and his foster father gone most of the day working. Um, but um, it really affected the way in which he experienced the neighborhood around him. The other significant thing was that he lost a really close um, cousin who was more like an uncle who lived two doors up the street from the Gergens, uh, a man named um, Jacob Gergen. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, not Jacob Gergen, that was, that was uh, an uncle, uh, Nick Gergen. And uh, Nick Gergen died from the influenza when uh, it made a kind of comeback in the um, early months of 1919. Um, and, you know, as I write in the book, um, really in 1917, death was, and 1918 to an even greater extent during the influenza, death was everywhere. But a nine-year-old boy can find ways of distancing himself from it. But when his um, cousin, who was really more like an uncle died, his cousin and his foster father were very close to one another. It really hits home and it alters, as I put it in the book, the balance of people in John's life. Uh, so I think it was a significant event for him. I think the influenza was a very significant event for him. Um, I have another question from Beth Pike, one of our colleagues from uh, the State Historical Society of Missouri. I'm happy that you're here, Beth. Um, if you could sit down and have coffee with John, what would you most like to know about him that you didn't learn from your research? Wow, what a great question and something that I've thought about so many times. And what I want to know more than anything else is whether he had a sister who was also raised by foster parents in St. Louis and whether he knew that this sister was a sister and not a cousin. Um, and at what point in his life he, he learned that that was the case and what his relationship with that sister was. Um, and, and she figures also fairly prominently in the book. So that's one thing I would like to ask him. A couple of other things I would really love to ask him are um, um, whether or not he ever met his um, half siblings from his mother's second marriage and how he felt about having been um, essentially given to uh, relatives in order to be raised. Um, depending on how the, how the conversation goes, we can talk a little bit about how his um, other family members remembered that particular situation. Um, but uh, I'd really like to know what John thought about it. And uh, so, so those are the main things I would ask him about these family relationships, which are so important the way we perceive of ourselves and the way we experience the world. Um, I'd like to know more about his political beliefs. I mentioned he joined a socialist organization. It was really a very far left social, socialist organization that celebrated communism in, in the Soviet Union. Um, and I'd like to find out more um, about how he felt about his own illness um, and the sense that he must have had that his life was going to end early. There's so many things. Wonderful question, Beth. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question. Uh, I have so many questions about John Gergen's mother and and how how it was that she was able to to give her first family's children away. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next questions. We we're getting a lot of questions, um, so I will get to all of them. So hang tight, everybody. Um, Nancy says, in addition to the library, were there settlement houses? Yeah. There were, and I write about those a good bit in um, the chapter of the book that focuses on Soulard. And there were um, several in the Soulard neighborhood. Um, there was one Catholic settlement house, which was probably the one that affected the Gergens the most. 
and it was uh, called the Guardian Angel House. And um, it's very likely that the Gergens, especially when John was adopted by them or, or fostered by them is the better word in 19, um, beginning in 1910, that they in one way or another benefited from this, um, from the services offered by the Guardian Angel House. My, my guess is that they would have turned to that house because it was Catholic and because the Gergens were Catholic. And the house, um, uh, the, the Guardian Angel House um, offered childcare when women worked. And we know from classified advertisements that she placed in newspapers that Rose Gergen, John's foster mother worked outside of the home, worked a tremendous amount inside of the home too. Uh, much of her life was really devoted to work. Um, but women who worked outside of the home could partake of the childcare services and um, the lunches that the settlement houses provided. But they were big factors, the settlement houses. Um, there was the Kingdom House, which was, I believe, Presbyterian. And then there was the, um, um, the, the there was a, another house that um, was non-denominational. There was another one that was um, run by um, Unitarians. So um, there were, um, there was quite a lot of settlement work in the neighborhood. Thanks for answering that. Thanks for that question. Um, That's a great question, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna move on uh, to the questions as they've come in. Um, uh, John asks a pretty good question, a really good question. Does it look as though John Gergen used Suderlin interchangeably with the um, American script or was it something that he only used when he was doing translations? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I wish now I had put some other images of the schoolwork where he's writing entirely in Suterland. And uh, he apparently was pretty good at it. His spelling was not great in either English or standard German, but, um, and, and that was pro probably, um, I, I sometimes wondered if he had a learning disability because he had problems with uh, correspondences that were phonetic. And of course, English is notoriously, notoriously unphonetic in its spelling, but, but uh, German is not, and he still had problems there. Um, but he apparently had really great eye-hand coordination because his Suterlin as well as his English script was just beautiful. But there are many pages that are only in Suterlin and only in German. And uh, it was quite a challenge to learn enough about Suterland to be able to decipher those. And I will confess to having had some help to pe from people who are a lot better at German than I am uh, in doing so. But Suterland is now not readable, I understand, even by most Germans. Um, and uh, it was the script of the day, of course, in the early 20th century. And I think it's just remarkably um, interesting. Wow. So good question. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, and and comments. Very interesting. Thank you. My entire family, both sides, immigrated to South St. Louis in the mid 1800s. Um, it might be interesting to know where we're from, Anne, um, if you want to put yeah. that in the chat box later somewhere down the line. Um, let's see, moving on. Um, Anne, uh, Anne, Ben, thank you for your touching presentation, um, made so wonderful by your obvious care for John and the dignity that you show him uh, in how you tell his story. Thank you. Um, Alan uh, says, my paternal family was German ancestry and my grandmother lived directly across the street from Beveau Mill. Oh, uh, thank oh. you. Thank you for your work and your presentation. Well, thank you. Did I pronounce that right, Bevo? Bevo. Bevo, Bevo thank you. Um, David uh, asks, did the Benet Swabian community mix with other, Im other immigrant or migrant communities in St. Louis, or did they remain separate and keep to themselves? If they mixed, with which migrant groups? The generation who migrated, not the generation born in the United States, was remarkably self-contained. Um, and this is shown through the patterns that they um, had in, in sharing housing arrangements, as well as the marriages that took place here in St. Louis, here in Soulard, um, after they 
arrived, uh, it fairly unusual for somebody from that generation to marry someone outside of the outside of the Venezuelan community. Um, and there were there, there was, for example, a, um, a a saloon that became a kind of gathering place for the Venezuelans. Uh, and so there were all kinds of ways that they continued to maintain their community after they migrated to St. Louis. It was a very different situation with the next generation. Um, and um, they um, tended to marry outside of um, the, the, um, the culture group and sometimes even outside of Catholicism. So, um, you know, for example, um, Anna, whom I mentioned, married uh, somebody of Italian descent. Uh, Catania. She was born in the United States. Her parents both migrated from the Bannet. And you see a very clear distinction between her generation and the marriages um, that, that um, her generation had in her parents' generation. Uh, many people did marry after they came to St. Louis. Um, John had aunts and uncles who did. And again, almost exclusively, they chose Bannet Swabians as their um, mates. Um, and, um, and, and sorry to be so heteronormative about this, that was just the culture of the time. Um, and um, the um, um, other thing I'll say about that is a really interesting exception was John Gergen's mother who married a man born in Germany. And uh, he also was a Protestant. He was of um, the same strand of Protestantism that is now the United Church of Christ. And uh, that's just really interesting because of the fact that she ended up having a different family who was of a different religion, who was of a, in some ways a different ethnicity uh, than her first family. Wow. That's a lot to unpack. Um, and uh, does, chime in later, she said her family um, immigrated from Northern Germany. Let's see, moving on. Let's see. Um, Adna says, uh, the level of detail you uncovered about John and your research is incredible. Can you tell us a bit about your research process and what kinds of records were most helpful? Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the research process for me was, just remarkably rewarding. Um, and it was aided by the fact that many of the sources came online either shortly before or during the period when I conducted this research. So in the early 2000s, and more and more would come online as, as the century progressed. So this book, I think, it, maybe it could have been written in the 1970s, say, but I don't think it would have been because it would have been just too hard, too difficult to uncover the, um, the um, details about John's life. Um, one of the keys, for example, was the 1930 census, which was released, I believe, oh, I should know this off the top of my head, but I believe it was around 2006 when it was released. And it was a key that helped me realize that John Grogan and John Albeck were the same person. Uh, and because John had so many names, it was kind of difficult at first to be able to ferret out exactly um, who he was. Um, but it was primarily archival sources. Um, some of these were um, on microfilm in the St. Louis County Library. Many of those that were on microfilm when I was conducting the research have since been put online by uh, Family Search. Um, and uh, some of them online by Ancestry.com. Um, the other useful source that uh, I found was uh, Newspapers.com because these just have primary sources at your fingertips that um, would have been very difficult to um, sort through otherwise. Uh, the Missouri Historical Society was remarkably helpful in um, helping me to identify photographs that were used in the book as were um, um, uh, as was the St. Louis um, Public Library, um, which has a really good um, archival uh, photography de depository. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting at your question, but it really was the primary research. Um, 
later I turned to secondary sources as a way of understanding to a greater extent the history of the Banat and of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it's interesting, I mentioned this in the presentation, that the um, published accounts of um, um, St. Louis history don't really mention this particular migration from the Banat, even though it's very significant to the history of the city. And I'm sure it was, uh, your research was made a lot more challenging because everyone, they sort of reused the same names over and over again. Mm -hmm. John, Jacob, Rose, they did. Anna. <laughs> That's um, another thing you see with the generation, change with the generation that was born in the United States, the names become more varied. It's just one of the signs that that generation is, of course, it's the parents who named them, but that, that generation is poised to become a, a, a different in, in character and culture from their forebears. All right, thanks. Uh, moving along. Um, Christine says, thank you, Ben, and thanks to you, Press, for offering the special. I'm ordering my copy right now. Thanks. I, we appreciate that, Christine. Um, I've especially found the slides in this presentation fascinating, and I can't wait to delve in deeper into the book. It was great to hear your lecture again. Christine, uh, that was Christine Fierdy. Um, oh, hello, Christine. <laughs> she was in one of the first classes I taught at Fontbon back in the back in the 90s. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and then Jeanette says, thank you for this great presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Can you tell us more about the photographs of John Gergen included in the presentation? Yes, thank you for that question. Those were given to me by Anna, um, John's, uh, Anna Catania, who is John's um, goddaughter and, and uh, cousin. And um, they, um, she, she was so generous about uh, sharing what she knew, which was not much. Um, John was really in many ways forgotten within his own family, but, but she did have these photographs and uh, she was so kind in sharing the things that uh, she had access to. So that's where the, all of the photographs of John came from. Uh, I'll take that back. I think one of them came from his uh, niece, uh, but, but the rest came from, from Anna. And, and the niece was very gracious too, but she had no memories whatsoever of John. And I asked her at one point if her mother, who was John's sister, who was raised as his cousin, ever mm -hmm. said anything about John. And the only thing that the niece recalled was that her mother had said that it was just a shame that he had died so young. Yeah. Um, let's see, moving on. I, I'm curious, what, what was her, what, was, what were the, Families' reactions when they when you came to them to ask start asking them about John Bergen were they surprised were they were they shocked were they <laughs> well you know in Anna's case I had to contact her multiple times and and I, I'm not by nature I think a very uh, persistent person but in this or at least not in that respect you know not not interpersonally but in this case I was and uh, she was when you know I finally um, was able to meet with her. She didn't really question the the project, uh, nor did John's niece um, and uh, other members of the family who were descendants of John's um, half siblings had never heard of him. And one in they, the, the the most interest actually came from those descendants, um, and. Um, one of them um, sent me an email and said she was very disturbed by the fact that her grandmother had never mentioned this previous family. She had known this grandmother as a girl, but she had no idea that the previous family um, existed. She said she found that very disturbing, that it changed her view of her grandmother. She didn't oh, wow. take it out on me. She was very kind to me and very interested in what I knew. She thanked me for, as she put it, giving John a voice. Um, but, um, you know, there was a huge silence there that um, had wow. um, really erased John from the family's memory. Wow. Um, we've got a lot of questions, so I do want to move on to them. So <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. Um, Beth jumped in. Uh, she said, Ben and Robin, terrific presentation. She's had to, she had to jump off, um, but she said, congratulations again on the book and, and they're, they're happy to promote it at the State Historical Society 
uh, of Missouri. And then Anna jumped back in and said that, Anne, sorry, Anne, uh, her maternal grandfather was, uh, was a Velcamp uh, and, and became the corporate secretary of, for Lemp Brewery. Oh, wow. Volkamp. 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 So um, I've never heard of that brewery. I'm, I'm assuming it is not still active. Uh, it's, it's, it is not still active. It became the International Shoe Company uh, after the Lent Brewery closed. And, but the building oh. is still there. And uh, it is a, an amazing architectural remnant in St. Louis. And, and the Lent Brewery's history is just fascinating. Wow, the International Shoe Com Company, which is um, where Tennessee Williams' father brought their family when, when they moved to St. Louis. <laughs> which, by the way, is another book we published. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll probably end up doing a talk about that one too. Um, John says, thank you for your, your wonderful presentation. Uh, Carol says, do you have a contact email where we can talk, we could talk more? This is Carol. Uh, I can't see your entire name. Um, if you feel comfortable, Ben, if you, if you want, um, if you want to give your email out. Um, sure. Would it be that? Or I put it in the chat or to just uh, say it? It's pretty um, straightforward. Yeah, put it in the chat if, or whatever. Yeah, if you want to put it, if you could put it in the chat, that'd probably work if you feel comfortable doing so. Okay. I absolutely do. Okay. Um, and then Marie, I'm sorry, Marie, if I didn't get to your, uh, your comment. She says, we understand some may have to leave at 5 p.m. Uh, it's now 5.09 uh, and that's okay. Um, we'll keep answering your questions though, as long as they come in. Um, or until 5.30, whichever comes first. Uh, I'm excited to answer all your questions, so I'm gonna keep moving. Um, Elaine, let's see. Elaine says, my grandmother was born in Rhineland, Missouri in 1902. I have her baptismal certificate in the German, in German from the from the ENR church. Wow. Wow. Um, Let's see, um, another attendee says, could you speak a little bit more about the socialist organization? I've read the book and recall descriptions of so much activity in Soulard, political of various sorts and other types. Yeah, the particular socialist organization that John was a part of was um, called um, the Workers Sick and Death Benefit Fund. And it had started out as a German organization in the late 19th century. Um, it had expanded and had quite a few chapters across the United States by the time that John joined in the 1920s. And it published a journal, which was called Solidarity, that was sent to all the members. And this was um, really interesting from a research standpoint because it was the only reading material that I know John had his hands on that, that you know, he, he actually received in the mail when it came out every month. And uh, when John died, um, John's name was duly noted in the deaths section of Solidarity. But um, Solidarity was really, as I mentioned, um, pretty far left. And it uh, took um, very clear positions on any number of questions that had not only to do with worker health and worker safety, but also larger questions like the rise of fascism in Germany. Um, it was a primarily German language organization. And there were four chapters in St. Louis, three of them were German language, and one of them was English language. So that gives you some idea of how important German um, heritage remained to that particular organization. Uh, it organized a protest when in the 1930s, a German um, ambassador visited St. Louis. Um, and um, it also um, ran a series of articles about um, the Scottsboro boys, as they were called at the time, and um, who, who had been um, accused of, of rape. And um, th there was a very strong racist angle to that particular accusation. They supported they ran articles in support of strikes in Harlan, Kentucky um, by the coal miners. So it, it was, I think, a way for, I, I think the organization was very important to John because it gave him a way to identify really as a proletarian rather than as a nobody. 
and it gave him a way to position himself relative to a system which had not always really worked in his favor. Whether we're talking about the work that he did as an iron worker or the um, schools that he passed through. So, so I think it was important to John to have this organization in his last years when he was struggling with a great deal, not only his tuberculosis, but also the, the poverty that came from not being able to work and the um, depression, which was deepening every year um, that, that um, John was suffering from tuberculosis. Uh, the Bennett Swabian Tavern that I mentioned, the saloon, um, hosted at one point a um, gathering, which was the organizational meeting for a chapter of the Communist Party in St. Louis, and that was in 1920. Um, so uh, this was, you know, cer certainly not all immigrants and certainly not all Bennett Swabians were um, inclined to this kind of leftist politics, but it was a strand of the thinking that was present in Soulard, and it coexisted alongside a lot of other strands of thinking, including German Catholicism. So, uh, and, and it was often in direct contradiction to other things that John was exposed to. And, and, and it, it was a complicating factor in who John was, and it was a complicating factor in the world that he lived in. Thank you for answering that question. And that was a great question. Um, Mike asks, uh, are there present descendants of the Bennett Swabians who actively keep their cultural identity alive? And if so, how? Well, there is a um, German society here in St. Louis, which is uh, primarily formed, which was originally formed as an aid society to help Bennett Swabian refugees who came to St. Louis following World War II. Bennett Swabians were essentially ethnically cleansed, expunged from uh, Romania, Yugoslavia, and to a certain extent, um, um, uh, Hungary following World War II. And many were, um, they were displaced persons then in the years following the war. And many came to St. Louis in a kind of second wave of migration. And the AIDS Society was originally formed to help them and it has since become this German cultural society. But as far as that first wave of migration, which was by far the larger wave of migration, which took place between 1903 and 1914, the part that John was a part of and his family was a part of, um, it, um, um, really has in, in many ways disappeared from the cultural map. Now I know individuals who are interested in their forebears, but as a kind of um, um, identity that has been passed on to subsequent generations, it really doesn't suggest, exist, nor does it really, um, nor, nor is it really present in the historical record of St. Louis. And I find that disappearance of the knowledge of Bennett Swabians, and there are exceptions, but I find that disappearance really interesting and really very difficult to explain. Yeah, that was a, that was kind of one of my questions is, um, you know, why is it largely been, why have these immigrants from that region been largely forgotten? So thank you for touching on that. And thanks, Mike, for that question. Um, Let's see, Alan uh, has a comment and a question. Also interesting is how South St. Louis, South Grand Avenue seemed to have a large influx and resettling of immigrants from parts of Asia with many new Vietnamese and other restaurants, et cetera. Um, is there any information available on these Im immigrations? I don't know if Ben can speak to that, but see if you can give it a try. I know very little about that migration, and so I won't say much because it wouldn't be with any, you know, authority. I've done a great deal of work with the Bosnian community here in St. Louis, uh, and it, it really started in the uh, many, many of the original Bosnian immigrants who came in the late 20th century and early 21st century started their lives in the same neighborhood where John Bergen died. Now, since they've moved into Afton and um, um, uh, Bayless and other neighborhoods to the 
south in, in the county. There are a few who remain back in the Bebo Mill neighborhood. But they followed a kind of southward moving pattern that was very similar to the Bennett Swabians, even though it was almost a century later. Um, so I know a good bit about that. You can Google the Center for Bosnian Studies and find out more about the work that we've been doing at Fontbon relative to that population. I'm sorry I can't uh, say more about the Asian population. Um, I, I do think there's great value in studying all of these um, movements because, well, for, for a variety of reasons that uh, are too, um, too, too many to enumerate here, but, but I appreciate the question. I'm sorry I can't answer it better. Um, and, uh, and comments, you think of such a rough life. It is surprising to see John so dressed up in a nice suit. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, this is true of most of the photographs from the family, um, that there, there were nice clothes. And I, I think it speaks to the pride that the family had. And I mean, pride in the best possible sense of the word right there, the aspirations that they had. Um, and, uh, and, and so, there was within these families, even though there were difficulties, there were also leisure. There was also leisure, and there was also, you know, a sense of uh, trying to achieve something culturally as well as economically. You know, the fact that they did become homeowners in that respect is significant. Now they lost the home; that's detailed in the book. But they were able to regain it later. Um, there. Um, uh, John's aunt and uncle by the name of Berger actually took over ownership of the home because of the fact that when he had his stroke, the elder John Gergen wasn't able to work any longer. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned John played the clarinet and saxophone. And so uh, there, there, there was this other side that I think is very important to remember that really makes their lives complicated and interesting. And that includes leisure and it includes the fact that they did have nice clothes. I don't know how many suits John had, um, but um, they were important for occasions like baptisms and graduations. And of course, John never graduated, but I'm sure he attended those of um, others in his family and, um, and um, confirmations and other kinds of occasions which really mark the lives. And the photo that's on the book cover is from a, a baptism, isn't that, is that correct? That's correct, that is Anna who was baptized, she is the infant that-, um, that And that's uh, John Gergen and his cousin? It's his cousin, exactly, yeah. yes. It's very confusing because there were two <laughs> Elizabeth Burgers and she was one of them. The other Elizabeth Burger was his sister, uh, who I think John thought of as a cousin, but um, that's who that is, yes. All right, um, Marie. My colleague at the library asks, question for me, how did these papers get saved in a house for a hundred years without getting discarded long ago? Like, were they behind a wall or something? That's I a really good I question. I, I wish I knew. I think they were probably on a shelf in a closet in the attic or in the basement um, where they could lay flat um, and uh, that um, they were preserved in that way and when this house was gutted, it, they were just tossed out. But I don't know exactly where in the house they may have been. There were, of was course, that, I'm sorry? Was it a house or was it an apartment building that was being- uh, It was a house that had been divided into an apartment building. Okay. Yeah, it, it was actually a duplex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it um, had several apartments and there were many people that had six apartments, in fact, uh, that had been carved out of the house, which is typical of St. Louis tenements. And, there were, and, and the Gurgans actually moved out of that house in 1920. They moved to an apartment in a, in a neighborhood of St. Louis called the Gravois um, Park neighborhood, which is about halfway between Soulard and Bebo Mill. And um, they um, left that schoolwork behind and it just somehow survived the numerous tenants who moved in after them. One of the things that we see among working class people in St. Louis, especially in the 19 teens and the decade before um, is, is a great deal of mobility, moving sometimes every year. And in, in the case of the Gergens, they, you, you can see a certain stability creeping into their lives as the number of times that they moved over a given period um, dropped. So they stayed in the um, house at 916 Allen Avenue where I found the schoolwork between um, 19, 
uh, 16 and 1920, they stayed about the same number of years in the apartment in Gravoy Park. And then they, John spent the rest of his life from 1924 on until 1935 in the cottage in Bebo Mill. Hmm. Um, Anne jumped in and, and mentions Lent Brewery closed during prohibition and it, is, and it has the fall staff logo. So thanks, Anne. Um, David says, thanks so much. Such an interesting microcosm of uh, American migration. And let's see. And said, thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Um, and then she has uh, one more question, which <laughs> we probably all wonder. I'm curious what made you look into the dumpster? <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Read the book. I, Buy the book, Anne, and then you'll find out. <laughs> I, I, was, I was jogging. And uh, I, um, it was, I was jogging down the alley to avoid the traffic on um, Allen Avenue. And uh, it was a construction dumpster. And there was enough visible on the top of the dumpster that I found interesting. And I'm just not shy about going into dumpsters if there's something that looks interesting. I could tell it was old <laughs> stuff. There was, a, there was a section of a barrister bookcase you know, that I still have. <laughs> and, uh, there was a um, um, enameled basin, which I also still have. In fact, I pulled a lot out of that dumpster besides just the schoolwork, but I don't write about that in the book. Um, and um, I um, even went back the next day to see if I had missed any of the papers, because that's what I really got um, fascinated with. I hadn't missed any of the papers, but I found everything from a silver plated uh, tea pitcher from the late 19th century to, uh, wow. uh, it had a date on it of 1883 and to a, it was, it was silver plate, not sterling silver, but it was still interesting to um, toys that I sometimes wonder could have been played with by John Gergen. Probably not. There was, for example, a wooden wagon that kind of about this, the size of a football that looked like it was homemade. Probably not because there were so many other people who lived there, but it's enough to spark the imagination. Well, I'm just so glad that it didn't rain all over everything in the dumpster and everything that you found and what, that, that you were able to salvage. How, how, many, how many days, over how many days did you keep going back to the dumpster? I only went twice. Okay. Okay, that was the first day when I found the papers and brought them home in the in the enamel basin. And then I went back the next day just to see what I had missed. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for asking that question, Anne. That was great. Um, if anybody else has any questions, it looks like we're getting towards the end of, of, the, of the questions. I wanna thank you guys so much for your great questions. Um, just, and and, just shout out if anyone has a last question. Um, and Ben, if you have any you know, final parting comments. I would only say thank you for your interest. It was uh, really wonderful to um, have this audience today and these questions. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody showing up. And once again, my gratitude to the University of Missouri Press and the University of Missouri Libraries. Well, we are grateful to have you as an author. So thank you so much for doing this presentation, Ben. Um, I will turn it over to Marie um, to, to close up shop. Okay, yeah, I just want to reiterate all that. It's been a wonderful afternoon. I, I thoroughly, I think I could speak for a lot of people saying we thoroughly enjoyed um, this, this dive into history and into um, our own past, our own Missouri past. So thank you so much for for bringing this out for us and for and to everybody who showed up really appreciate spending time with you all today i hope you all have a wonderful evening and we'll see you at the next book talk maybe yeah please join us thank you so thank much you. okay bye bye bye